All right, and I did, I did post uh, the last recording. So now let me go to the screen share and let's just have everything up there. So you guys can see all the cool stuff on my desktop. <laughs> all right, so where we had left, let me, uh, I have a whiteboard here to pull that up. Can you guys see the whiteboard? No. Let me stop the share and restart yeah. it. Uh, let me restart it that way. You saw it. Oh, it did pop up? All right, well, now, now you can definitely see it. All right, I'm gonna minimize that for right now until I need it, but I just like it, like it to be there. All right, so where we left off, let me pick up from, where am I at, slideshow, from current slide, there we go. All right, so where we left off is just to remind you, um, going back to, actually, let me do this, I'm sorry. If we look at a periodic table, this is a, would be a better way to do it. If we look at a periodic table, <coughs> remember the column number will tell you how many valence electrons an atom has. The column number in the ones place will tell you how many valence electrons. So hydrogen has, uh, this column has one, this column has two. Uh, column 13 has three valence electrons. Column 14 has four valence electrons and so on. The, um, <coughs> the other thing is, um, remember the electrons are in layers. The valence electrons, what layer the valence electrons are in is the row number. So everything in the first row, the valence are in the first layer. We call those energy levels. This is the second layer. The valence electrons are in the third layer. And that's important because remember each layer is on top of the, the layer underneath it. So that means, um, for example, there's one electron in the valence for cesium, but it's in the sixth layer. So it's pretty far away from that nucleus. Then remember this has this, um, the, the one, one of the periodic tables has a stair step line, which goes like this. This particular periodic table has things shaded. Remember everything to the right in this particular periodic table in green, those are non-metals. Non-metals like to gain electrons. Everything else over here, including these, the, the purple ones, those are metals. Metals like to lose, like to lose electrons. And the, the reason is, is they want to have their valence either empty or filled. And what that means is basically the valence is gonna have eight if it's filled or zero if it's empty. And so you can figure out how many electrons, it's, it's gonna do whatever is easier, how many electrons will it gain or lose depending on how easy is it to get to eight. So if you're, for example, in column 16, where there are six valence electrons, you're either gonna add two electrons to get to eight or remove six to get to zero. And of course, it's much easier to add two than to remove six. So if you add electrons, remember electrons are negatively charged. So if you add electrons, you become negatively charged. If you gain electrons, you become, I'm sorry, if you lose electrons, you become positively charged. So gain electrons, negative, lose electrons, positive. If you just remember electrons are negatively charged, you can figure that out. Because if you're gaining negative, you become negative. And so again, just using oxygen as an example, oxygen has six valence electrons. It wants to have eight, so it's gonna gain two electrons. So it's gonna typically form a charge of negative two when it forms an ion. Um, magnesium, has, well, let's do a different one. Aluminum has three electrons in its valence. It's going to, it, it wants to get to zero because either losing three to get to zero or gaining five to get to eight. So it's gonna typically lose zero, lose three. If it loses three negatives, it will become a plus three charge. And we, we went through that last time. So I just wanted to, so we went, went all through that. Then I talked about charge, charge interactions because we wanted to get to, okay, so it wants to gain electrons and it wants to lose electrons. How easy is it for them to do that. Just because I want to do something doesn't mean I can necessarily pull it off. And that's what this is about. And again, it's a scary looking equation, but we're not, we're never gonna plug numbers in. But what this means really is that the bigger the charges, the stronger the interaction. And it doesn't matter if it's a, uh, an attractive interaction. So a, a positive negative uh, will be an attractive interaction. 
a negative negative or a positive positive alike charges will repel it doesn't matter if it's attractive or repulsive it matters how big the charges are so bigger charges will attract more strongly or will repel more strongly. And then more importantly for, for the understanding we're going to is just looking at the distance because the charges we're talking about are the nucleus and the valence electron. So that's why looking at the row number is important because for example, in the first column, everything wants to lose one electron. Well, lithium's electron is much closer to the nucleus than cesium's electron. So that means for to lose electrons, as I go down a column, the only thing that's holding it in is that nucleus. So as I go down a column, that nucleus is further and further away. So it's going to be harder, it's going to be easier and easier to lose that electron. So cesium, CS, is going to lose electrons way better, or it's going to be much easier for it to lose elect its electron than, say, lithium. And then from the others on the other end of the table where things are trying to gain electrons, it's going to be as you go down the column, the only thing that pulls the electrons in is the nucleus. So everything in column 17 just needs to gain one electron. Fluorine is a much smaller atom than iodine, right? The nucleus is much closer. So it's going to be easier for fluorine to gain that electron than, say, for iodine. And we talked about that. That's kind of where we left off. All right, so yeah. Um, I was wondering, oh, I lost my question. I'll have it in a second, sorry. Say it again. I lost my question, I'll have it in a second. Okay, when it comes back, just, just let me know. All right, so I kind of just alluded to this. So this is a couple of slides from where we left off. So remember that uh, as we go across the row, atoms tend to get smaller, and we talked about that. The reason they get smaller is that the nuclear charge, the number of protons increases, all the electrons you're putting in are in the same layer. So if we go across the first row, right, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, the valence electrons are in the second layer, but there's more and more protons, so it's going to have a stronger attraction. That's Excellent. why the atoms get smaller. As we go down, a, oh, go ahead, your question. Can, can, all ele can all elements be reduced to their base form, or because of these things, will they automatically bond with something? Um, I think not every element can exist just as the as the atom because some of them are extremely reactive you could probably isolate them most can though most you can actually see in the elemental form but single atom like um like fluorine chlorine bromine always exist as two but most you can all right as we go down a column i, I said atoms get much larger and that's because that's what this slide is that's because though uh, we're adding an entire layer of electrons, all right? And so the effect on attraction, I just talked about. I think this, I, I don't, I think this is about where we left off. I mean, we might've gone one more slide. So as we go across the row, attraction for electrons tends to increase. And as we go down a column, attraction for electrons tends to decrease, all right? And then putting it all together, all right, so if we put it together, as we go across the row, atoms are gonna get smaller. Attract, therefore, the attraction for electrons increases. Now, this plays into reactivity. For non-metals, uh, they're trying to gain electrons. So that means they're gonna take, let me, um, where is it? So for non-metal, so again, this part here, the first two bullets, atoms get smaller, attraction for electrons increases, it doesn't matter if that's a metal or a non-metal. That's all atoms. So we go across the row. Metals and non-metals will get smaller. The attraction for electrons will increase. Non-metals are trying to gain electrons. So if you're trying to gain electrons, this is a good thing. Because as you move, as you get smaller and smaller, it's going to be easier and easier to gain the electrons. Therefore, non-metals tend to be more reactive as we go across the row. I want to make sure you guys have that. Then as we go down a column, okay, wait, I'm sorry. Metals, <clears throat> still going across the row, metals are trying to lose electrons. Well, as you get smaller and smaller, since the attraction for electrons increases, it's much harder to lose something that you're holding on to more tightly. So metals tend to be less reactive as we go across the row. Now, in a class like this, you could just memorize you know, the reactivity trends, 
but it, it makes more sense to memorize what happens with the size, understand what metals and nonmetals do, and understand how charges interact. Because if you know those three things, you can figure out everything else. Um, may, I, may I ask one question? You can ask um, five questions. Well, I won't. Um, on something like um, tennisocene, I, I think it is, where Which it's one? a metal that's way far to the right, and all it would have to do to get to eight is gain one. How come that metal doesn't want to gain? Something like bismuth or lead? Yeah, yeah, yeah that'll work. Yeah, well, that's because that's a very good question. Actually, it's a, that's a kind of a detailed one. It's you're right. It would it would be much easier for it to gain three than say to lose five, right? Because these ones are the ones in here. Um, there's a little bit of a an extra thing to that that I'm not talking about. See, for what I'm talking about, the ones from scandium down to mercury, you might want to just pretend they're not there for right now. But it's because the electrons are so far away from the nucleus that it's still easier for them to say lose five electrons than to actually gain three. But that's a really good question. It's, the, the size is a big deal. And if, if, if you want, if you're thinking mathematically a little bit, if you back up to that equation, it's the, the distance squared. So it really makes a big difference. Good question though. All right, so going back to here. So then as we go down a column, you're gonna see the opposite trends in reactivity because the atoms are gonna get bigger, which means attraction for electrons will decrease. That means going down a column, the metal, the non-metals are gonna be less reactive because attraction for electrons decreases and the metals will become more reactive. So one would expect on a periodic table, you would expect the most, the most reactive uh, non-metal to be fluorine. The reason it's not helium or neon or argon is these ones have full valences. So there's, they're not trying to gain anything. So as far as reactivity, you could take the last column completely off the table. They're actually, their most important characteristic is they're extremely unreactive. They used to be referred to as the inert gases, but some smart aleck chemist said, don't tell me they won't react, I'll make them react. And they do, but they react under like high pressure, high temperature, really harsh conditions with, with really react. So you'd expect fluorine to be the most reactive non-metal. You'd expect francium, to be the most reactive metal, lower left-hand corner. So with that in mind, let me make this, let's go from here. Let's let you guys just try a couple. Let's just, um, looking at a periodic table. So hopefully you have, it, it's easier. If you guys have a periodic table, that would be easier than me kind of clicking between. So maybe starting um, the next lecture, make sure you have a periodic table handy so I don't have to, well, to click in between. And once we get into the classroom, so actually I'm gonna do this. Let me get out of here just so I have a periodic table here. So um, between potassium and calcium, so between K and Ca, first of all, are they metals or non-metals? Metals. They're metals. Which of them would you expect to be more reactive? Potassium. Or, pardon me? Potassium. Potassium, very good, because it's further to the left, very good. All right, see how you can do that? Uh, now, how about, uh, oh yeah, it says, these are definitely metals. It says, circle the more reactive metal, duh. Oh, let me see what's in the chat, I'm sorry. Uh, someone said, what, what's on the periodic table? table? Yeah, 10th edition, page seven. Right, yeah, or you can even yeah, print one that I've given you, either way, yeah. Okay, so how about, whoops, how about, it's windy, I got all my windows up. How about, um, Magnesium and calcium. So magnesium and calcium are in the same column. What would you expect to be more reactive? Calcium. Calcium, very good. So remember metals get more reactive as you go, um, less reactive to the right, more reactive to the left, more reactive down, less reactive up. Doing diagonal comparisons, like if I was gonna go lithium versus magnesium, that's a tough call because lithium's further to the left, magnesium's further to the right, but lower down. It's kind of a which wins. I won't do that to you. All right, and there's that circled, so to speak. Now let's try it with nonmetals. All right, so here's two nonmetals, um, oxygen and nitrogen. So right here, which of these two would you expect to be more reactive, oxygen or nitrogen? Nitrogen. Okay, I had one. Oxygen. Nitrogen. Oxygen. 
because non-metals become more reactive as we go to the right. Oxygen, people don't think about it, but oxygen is actually extremely reactive. Super uh, flammable, right? Well, that's an interesting question because burning means combines with oxygen. So it, 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 a better way of saying it is oxygen supports combustion. It, it is burned combustion. because Sorry, of oxygen, that. right? Um, um, and then fluorine and chlorine, F and Cl, which one would you expect to be more? Just going down a column of their non-metals. Chlorine. Chlorine. chlorine should be more reactive. Very good. Yeah. Just backing up to oxygen. Most people you don't think about is oxygen reactive. Oh yeah. You know the the the, the, um, the biochemistry of aging is very very interesting topic. And uh, right now it seems that the last I haven't I haven't followed it for a while. So this could be very dated information. But the last time I read it. Um, it's interesting that what keeps you alive is also what eventually kills you. <laughs> um, because it, I, I, you know, oxygen, you need it for all the reactions that your body does, but it actually kind of does some damage because it's extremely reactive. And over 60, 70, 80, 90 years, it just kind of starts, you know, the hits start to, the hits start to pile up. So it's kind of like what, what keeps you alive is also what eventually kills you, which is kind of interesting. All right. So now, um, Okay, so I want to make sure you can do that. Now we're going to look at um, forming compounds. All right, so we did a lot with atoms. So at this point, you should be able to pick any two metals. What's more reactive? Well, you know, same column, same row, same with nonmetals. And I'd like you to be able to explain why, right? And it really has to do with attraction for electrons. What I would say, if I was to ask an essay question on an exam, it might be something like, Explain why, as we go down a column, metals become more reactive and non-metals become less reactive. And the type of answer would be, well, uh, down a column, atoms get bigger, which means the attraction for electrons decreases. Metals are trying to lose electrons, so it makes it easier to lose. Non-metals are trying to gain electrons, makes it harder to gain, which is what I said. But that would be putting it into a short answer type of a thing, all right? Just really quick. So yeah. both metals and non-metals, as we move to the right, get more reactive. And both metals and non-metals, as we go down, get more reactive? No. I'm glad you asked. As we move to the right, both metals and non-metals increase the attraction for electrons. As we go down a column, both metals and non-metals decrease the attraction for electrons. But because metals are trying to lose electrons and non-metals are trying to gain, they're going to have opposite reactivity trends from one another. So if you're trying to lose electrons, attraction for electrons is bad. If you're trying to gain electrons, attraction for electrons is good. Does that help? Uh, or just to understand it too, um, so the nonmetals are, are trying to lose it. So will they become more reactive as you go down the column or? Nonmetals are trying to gain electrons. Okay. So nonmetals are trying to gain, the metals are trying to lose it. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so then, so the nonmetals are more reactive the higher in the column, and the metals are more reactive the lower you go in the column. Exactly. And you know what? what if you have trouble, a little trouble keeping it straight, this slide right here, slide number thirty-four, is a is a good summary of it. It even says sum up. All right. Any other questions? These are great questions. All right. Now, atoms combine to form compounds, and we talked about what compounds are before, and they're held together by chemical bonds. Very important, this is another place where people use terms interchangeably, but they actually don't mean the same thing. So you don't wanna confuse chemical bonds with what are called intermolecular forces, and let me see what my next slide is. All right, so a bond is between atoms within a molecule, and if you break and form them, it's a chemical change. All right, and you're making new stuff. So for example, if you look at this slide, I'm gonna to try to do this this way, really look at it that way. All right, if you look at this slide, you can see that the bond in this chemical reaction, we take hydrogen and combine it with oxygen to make water. You can see that the hydrogen, the bond here is breaking, this bond here is breaking, this is breaking, and then I'm forming new bonds. So the bonds between the hydrogen and the hydrogen are breaking, oxygen and oxygen are breaking, and now I'm forming bonds between hydrogen and oxygen. So chemical bonds 
are what hold the hydrogen to the oxygen or the hydrogens to each other. And that's what making new substances is. Another analogy, well, I'll give you another analogy. In a minute. Intermolecular forces are really between molecules and it's when molecules stick together. So when we talked about solids, liquids, and gases, what holds a liquid together is really intermolecular forces, not bonds. Typically we say bonds, but it's really intermolecular forces. Okay. Is that the difference break? between a chemical bond and a mechanical bond? Or that's different, right? Uh, well, we don't use the word mechanical bond, but the, in that context, I'd say a mechanical bond would be an intermolecular force. But really a better, the better term would be intermolecular force because inter between molecular molecules, right? But it's important, it's between versus within. And remember we said in a chemical change, you make new stuff, right? And what's happening at the atomic level is you're breaking and forming chemical bonds. In a physical change, like boiling water, you're breaking the interactions, the intermolecular forces. So you're not making, um, you're not specifically making new stuff, you're just separating them from one another. How they work, the specifics of how they work we'll cover later on in the course, all right? And this is actually, this slide has this because I copied and pasted this picture, but the word hydrogen bond, which is used a lot in chemistry and in biology, in biology, it's a big important term. A hydrogen bond is not a bond, it's actually an intermolecular force. So here's an example of even the people in the field use the word kind of incorrectly. And it causes confusion, especially for students. Another analogy, let me see if the next slide. Another analogy, if you just think of, think of your hands. If I take my hands, if you guys can see this, and I interlace my fingers like this. My, my hands are now held together, but they're held together by intermolecular forces. Because if I separate them, right, they're still my hands. I haven't changed them. But if I was to pull my finger off my hand like that, now that would be like breaking and forming a chemical bond, all right? Because it's different, or these are still the hands. So intermolecular forces are really just molecules sticking to each other, where chemical bonds are, they're actually attached, uh, and, and how the chemical bonds work is where we're going next, all right? But it's important to make that distinction. When you boil water or you, um, or you melt ice, you're breaking intermolecular forces. Even when substances dissolve in one another, it actually, dissolving depends. But if you were to, to dissolve sugar in water, you're basically, that, that's gonna be, uh, you're, you're taking sugar molecules that are just sticking to each other and you're putting water molecules in between them. So that's that, that type of a dissolving process. Uh, when a protein folds and, and forms its three-dimensional structure, it's literally just kind of wrapping itself around itself like this and it sticks to itself. That's intermolecular forces. Surface tension in water, right? Or uh, the fact that water you know, forms big drops, the water molecules are sticking to each other when it comes out of a dropper. Those are intermolecular forces. Uh, viscosity, the gooiness of liquids. All right, now, Chemical bonds come really in three, I break it into three types. Textbooks sometimes will make it into two. There are what are called ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and polar covalent. I like to make the distinction purely covalent versus polar covalent, all right? And, and someone asked about this uh, the other day. Covalent, so if you, again, thinking of roots of words, valent like valence, Co, like sharing, like cohabitate, right? Sharing a residence. So covalent, you're sharing the valence, okay? Ionic, like other pertaining to ions. So that should help you remember it. So let's go through uh, each type. Ionic bonds are between ions. That's why, what it sounds like. They are the weakest of chemical bonds. They involve complete electron transfer. They're held together only by the fact that the positive ion will stick to the negative ion. And they are polar. Now the word polar means has positive and negative sides, All right? So in a polar bond, there's a positive side and a negative side. You might be familiar with polarity like on a battery, a battery has a positive pole and a negative pole. It's the same idea, all right? A polar bear has a positive end and a negative end. Oh, I don't know about that. All right. Um, remember that show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Did you guys ever see that when it was on? And I got stumped. 
I, I got stumped. I was watching it with one of my kids and they were younger because it was on TV. And they said, do polar bears eat penguins? And I was wrong. I said, yes. You know why polar bears don't eat penguins? Anyone know? Arctic versus Antarctic? Exactly. They just live in different parts of the world. But I'll bet you money, if you put them in the same place, they probably would. <laughs> yep. They never, they don't even know each other exist. All right. And then uh, ionic bonds are between metals and non-metals. Why? Well, remember, metals lose electrons and non-metals gain electrons. So a metal, really what happens in an ionic bond uh, is a metal, let me, let me go, to the, uh, go to the whiteboard here. Juggling things. There it is. So if I take um, something like, let's say, a sodium ion, sodium and chlorine, right? Sodium wants to lose an electron like that, and it becomes a sodium ion. And if you look at your periodic table, right, it wants to lose one electron. Chlorine wants to gain an electron becomes Cl minus. And so that there's your complete electron transfer. Sodium literally loses an electron to chlorine. And now what happens is the positive here sticks to the negative. And so if you write it like this, NaCl, right? There's my positive side. There's my negative side. That's salt, right? That's sodium chloride table salt. Yeah, table salt, right? And so that, and so you can see if we back up, it's, it's polar, it's got a positive and negative side, has complete electron transfer. The reason that they're weak um, is these ions are pretty stable because they've lost the electron to get to that empty valence, gain the electron to get to the full valence, and there's something magically stable about that. But there, I think you can kind of see all the stuff with that. All right, let me go to the next slide. Um, one. Oh, it's thinking. There we go. There we go. Purely covalent bonds are equal sharing of electrons. All right. So they are nonpolar. They're the strongest of chemical bonds, and they're typically between two of the same nonmetal. All right. Now, to give you an example, if we look at chlorine, let's go back to here. Chlorine has in its outer level, it has, we'll just say, I'm going to put, I'm just going to put one, elect, there's seven electrons. I'm just going to put one electron right here though. Okay. Let me uh, erase kind of this mess that I made here. Let's try this again. Okay. Chlorine has seven electrons in its, in its valence, but for the purposes of this, I'm going to do this one more time. I'm just going to just draw one of them. Let's just talk about just one of them. Another chlorine, and remember chlorine wants one more. Another chlorine is exactly the same because chlorine is chlorine. And then yes, there's seven, but we'll just talk about one. Now each of these chlorine wants one electron. So this chlorine goes, oh look, there's one. I'm gonna grab onto it. And this chlorine goes, oh look, there's one. I'm gonna grab onto it. And so I can't really erase Oh, uh, anyway, and so if I kind of redraw it, like teardroppy, right? Here's the electrons that it's sharing, and and the and, and also they each have the same attraction for electrons, right? Because chlorine is going to have the same attraction for electrons as chlorine. So it's kind of like, think of it like a tug of war between two opponents of equal strength and equal ability. So they're literally fighting over the electrons and they're bonded together through that, right? Uh, a good analogy, uh, I'm sure many of you have a sibling, brother or sister close to your own age. And remember back when you were little kids and maybe you had a toy and your parents told you to share it. And so then you're sharing it, but then you're, let's say it's your, your, I have two brothers and they're pretty close in age. So let's say I had a toy and my brother, I was supposed to share it with my brother, but as soon as my brother grabbed it, I pulled on it and we we're having, we we're fighting over it. We were bonded together through our mutual attraction for that toy. That's called sibling bonding, right? But it's, um, that, that's the idea in a covalent bond, they're each attracted to those electrons. 
and they're attracted, you know, in, if it's the same atom, chlorine, chlorine, oxygen, oxygen, they're attracted equally. And that means that the, the electrons that they're sharing are held equidistant between the two atoms. So purely covalent, there's no polarity because the electrons are in the middle. Is that why we get a lot of dioxides? Not really, no. That, that, uh, but but we, we're going to get into kind of naming and where that comes from, so that might answer it a little bit later. All right, a polar covalent bond would be unequal sharing of electrons. So obviously it's polar because it, it, that's the name. But if we look at F, let's let's look at these two examples. I'll do this back on the whiteboard. Let me just clear this off here. All right. So let's look at fluorine and chlorine. Now remember from what we talked about before, fluorine has a stronger attraction for electrons than chlorine does, right? Because it's higher up on the, they're both nonmetals, higher up on the periodic table. So if I have this pair of, so fluorine goes, here's the electrons. Um, what's gonna happen is fluorine is gonna pull the electrons, let's say the electrons here, Fluorine is going to pull them closer to itself because it's got a little bit more attraction. So I mean, if I draw it like that, uh, let's make it even closer. Like that. So the electrons are going to be closer to fluorine because it has a higher attraction. So what that does, if we go back to the, the pole, the purely covalent, think of the electrons. I'm going to redraw it like this. The electrons would be in the, in the layers around the molecule would be evenly distributed, right? These are my electrons. But in fluorine and chlorine, the electrons are gonna be held more closely to fluorine, like this. It's gonna pull the electrons towards itself because it has a higher attraction. So that means if I take a, a negative charge, electrons, and I pull them close to me, it gives me a little bit of negativity. And if I'm the, the, the chlorine, the electrons are pulled away from me a little bit, not off of me but away from me, it exposes that positively charged nucleus. And so what we get is what's called a, a, a polarity, not a charge, but a polarity. The way we represent it in chemistry is we use, so we use plus minus if it's a full charge. Uh, if it's partial charge, like it's just kind of a little bit negative, we use this symbol, it's a lowercase Greek letter delta. This means partial. We stole this from calculus. So this would be, a partial negative side, and this would be the partial positive side. But for the purposes of this class, you could just call it negative and positive for the purposes of this class, but it's not a full charge. It's just holding the electrons closer. And remember, which one's gonna be more negative? It's gonna be the one with the stronger attraction for electrons. Someone in the chat the other day used this word. I'm not gonna really use it in this class, but since someone brought it up, a big sound smart word. Electronegativity is a big word that means attraction for electrons in a bond. So when you're actually in a bond. But again, yeah, I don't care if you ever see that, if you ever use this word again, I'm not going to use it again. But someone brought it up in the chat. But it's, it's just attraction for electrons. So in a bond, the atom that has a higher attraction for electrons will be the negative side. Now, if it's an ionic bond, a metal and a nonmetal, the, the, the metals, you know, a metal and a non-metal come up to each other. The non-metal wants its electrons and the metal says, well, here you go. I don't want them anyway. So it just gives them to them. But non-metals are going to fight over them a little bit. If they're the same non-metal, it's going to be an equal fight. If they're different non-metals, one of them is going to have a little bit stronger attraction. Whoops, there's a PowerPoint. All right. So between two different nonmetals. So for the purposes of this class, you can think ionic is metal nonmetal, purely covalent is two of the same nonmetal, polar covalent will be two different nonmetals. Uh, and actually this is the summary, I just said that, all right? Oh, I look at, I do have the word electronegativity in there, my apologies. I just said I wasn't gonna say it again and there it crept into the slide. But just remember, it's the one with the stronger attraction for electrons. So I just said this. 
Ionic is going to be between a metal and a non-metal. It has ions. That's how you can remember it. Metals are, and non-metals. Metals are going to give away their electrons to non-metals. And of course, they're going to be polar because if I lose electrons, I'm positive. If I gain them, I'm negative. Polar covalent, it's going to be two different non-metals. The one with the stronger attraction for electrons will be the negative side. And the polarity varies. Yes, it'll be polar. It goes from barely polar to really polar. So polar is really a continuum. And then purely covalent is two of the same number. All right. So I think this is the last slide, is it not yet? So this is, uh, yeah, this is the end of this, this slide. So let me just summarize, you know, in one slide, this, there's a, we covered a lot of ground on, on, uh, in this set of slides. You know, in a more traditional chemistry class, this would have taken maybe a month, but we would have gone into a lot more detail about structure. But again, it's, it's for what we need to do for this class, this is more than sufficient, all right? So uh, this class just has different purposes than some other classes. So <clears throat> anyway, so you know, make sure you know from the, the set of slides, the parts of the atom, how they're arranged, right? Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, electrons are on the outside. You should know uh, the difference between an atom, an ion, and an isotope. So atoms are neutral, ions are charged, and they differ in the number of, uh, an atom differs from the ion in the number of electrons. Isotopes are atoms of the same type with different numbers of neutrons, or you could say different masses because different numbers of neutrons. They're the same because they have the same number of protons. <laughs> so anything with 28 protons is nickel. That's just all there is to it, all right? And then we've spent a lot of time on the periodic table. I think I told you for the first time I showed you a periodic table that it's kind of a map. And from that map, you can tell if it's a metal, if it's a non-metal, you can tell how many electrons it's got in its valence. You can tell how many electrons it's likely to want to gain or lose, uh, what type of an ion it will form, all sorts of stuff. Even you can compare metals to each other and say of these two metals, which one should be more reactive of these two non-metals, which one should be more reactive. You can't really compare metals to non-metals because it's comparing apples and broccoli. You know, they're like, they're not even close to the same thing. And then, you know, yeah, this is the last stuff we talked about. All right, so that's a good, that's the end of these slides. I'm gonna move into the next ones. I won't finish them today, but I'll get, I'll make a dent because the next set of slides is the first, is the last set of slides for the first exam. And so the plan is we'll finish those slides on Monday. We might even start another set. On Wednesday of next week, we're gonna do just an exam review day. And uh, the week after that, Monday is a holiday. Wednesday will be in the room and we'll the first day back face-to-face, -face, I'm gonna give you an exam, which I know it might be a little weird, but the timing's right. And it, 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 it's, I like giving it, I don't wanna give exams online. So I think that'll work. Right. If we had Monday, Wednesday, it would be different, but we don't. Is, is right. it for sure on the date we're returning? Pardon me? It, it's it's written in stone the day we're returning, right? Well, it's written in, I'd say it's written in clay, uh, it, the only, but the clay is hardening. Unless something weird happens, like all of a sudden there's another COVID spike in the next two weeks, then yes. In fact, my department, some, some of the chemistry classes are going back next week. Uh, we're we're in the group that's going back in two weeks, and she just my department chair just sent out a reminder. So yeah, absolutely. And I don't like teaching online. So uh, anyway, all right. So let's let me give you a moment to catch your breath. Let me, let me close this one. Let me clear this. And. Uh, you know, you asked what room we're in for in-person instruction. It says in the syllabus, I want to say room three, MS 322, but I'll, I'll double check. But uh, next Wednesday, I will remind you. And I'll, what I'll do is uh, when I send out an announcement, I'll remind you then as well. Okay, because I'm sending out announcements on Sunday nights. And so I'll send you an announcement. I'll say, don't forget we're meeting in this room at this time. And, da -da 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 -da. and make sure you read through, um, you know, basically, the um, there's a, you got emails from the campus about the the policy. So we're going to be wearing masks the whole time, which 
I'm pretty confident I can talk through a mask. So, but, you know, it's a little inconvenient, but we'll, we'll be all right. All right. So now we're going to get into a, a little bit of uh, naming chemicals. So that's kind of cool. You'll be able to start reading, you know, reading labels and knowing what compounds are called and you know, say, oh, well, here's the formula. Uh, with the nomenclature is, um, so chemical nomenclature is a naming system. There's really a couple different, there's three types of compounds. There's um, covalent compounds, right? Uh, covalent bonds, there's ionic compounds and, and acids have their own nomenclature. And then there's organic nomenclature for organic chemistry. And we're gonna go into, uh, we're gonna do it in pieces. So I'm not gonna do like a whole, do all the nomenclature. We're gonna do covalent nomenclature first and some organic nomenclature. And then we'll uh, later on when we do more with ionic compounds, we'll do uh, the ionic nomenclature, right? So we're gonna do covalent compounds, writing and balancing chemical equations, chemical reactions. So this is good stuff. All right, so nomenclature is the naming system. And what happened years and years and years and years ago is people would just name a compound because it's, it, it, it was blue or they named the compound because they found it here. And so there's a lot of common names. Uh, the names of the elements are common names. Why is it called sulfur? Because someone said, hey, we found this yellow rock. Let's call it sulfur. Right? Why is it called sodium? Because someone called it that. So those are common names. Actually, um, there is a movement to do. So what they did is they came up, the they that I'm referring to is uh, the group that does this is called the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry. Uh, it's right here. It's IUPAC. International, you know, I don't care if you remember what it stands for, but they have meetings every time, all the time. And they talk about, you know, naming conventions. Uh, just the idea that the periodic tables change the numbering system, that was them. All right. So, you know, eventually it got to a point where you had just memorized thousands of names and it was cumbersome, right? Uh, if you've taken biology and you've had to memorize genus and species of various animals, right? It's somewhat arbitrary. So they came up with a system. Uh, there are some common names that you need to memorize. For this class, there are two. And they are H2O. So H2O is not called dihydrogen monoxide. It's called water. And if you speak another language and you want to use your native language's name for that, I'll give it to you. All right. Uh, and then NH3 is ammonia. So don't do, don't do this. So NH3. And you, you're familiar with the smell. This is not the same as this. And I know some of you are laughing because it is a little funny, but people make mistakes like this all the time. And the different, you know, remember, there's the difference between being ignorant and just, you know, ignorant means you don't know better. I actually have a definition for stupid. Stupid means you know better, but you do it anyway. I think most people can agree with that. I know I shouldn't do that, and yet I did it. So, but anyway, um, so if you hear someone say, my friend is really sick, he has a bad case of ammonia. No, your friend has pneumonia. And just politely correct them because they, they, you know, they need to be reminded. Or, you know, I've got to go to the store to clean the, to clean the house. I'm going to buy a bottle of pneumonia. No, you're going to buy a bottle of ammonia. So don't mix them up. And you'll hear people do it. You'll develop an ear for stuff like that, all right? So don't make that mistake. But these two, we don't use, we use the common names just because they're so common. All right, so the IUPAC system, different types of compounds are named differently. I just said ionic compounds have a different system than covalent compounds, and we're gonna do ionic later. All right now, um, there's a handful of elements that uh, don't really, that kind of don't use it either. And let me uh, also, um, a molecule, we said an atom is the smallest piece of an element. The smallest piece of a compound is called a molecule. And again, if I break water up into hydrogen and oxygen, well, those are smaller than water, but they're not water anymore. Just like if I take an electron out of an atom, that's actually smaller than the atom, but it's no longer that element. So the smallest piece of a molecule that is still that, com that substance, that compound, I'm sorry, the smallest piece of a compound that is still that compound is a molecule, all right? Again, if you separate the hydrogen from the oxygen and water, it's no longer, doesn't have those properties anymore, all right? 
There's a handful of elements that uh, Douglas asked this question before. Most, uh, a lot of elements exist in nature just by themselves. There's a small number of them don't really exist uncombined for various reasons. And the way I memorize it, it's all of the gens. So hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. The column 17 on the periodic table, uh, some of the columns have names. I won't test you on the names of the, of the columns, but eventually they're kind of nice to know. Column 17 is called the halogens. So column 17. I don't know where they got the name. I'm sure I could find it if I looked it up. This is the uh, fluorine, chlorine. Well, the elements, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine astatine, but who cares, all right? So the, all of the gens, when they're by themselves, they're diatomic. So the way I teach it, it's the gens, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and then the halogens, which are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So if we say it reacts with hydrogen, it's reacting with H2, or it forms chlorine, it's forming Cl2. Now, if chlorines combine with another element, we will name it appropriately. All right. Now, for nomenclature of covalent compounds, right? A covalent compound is two nonmetals because remember we said nonmetals form covalent bonds. So it's a compound of two nonmetals. And what we do is we use prefixes. So we use the prefix, the first element, prefix, the second element, and the second element is going to have an ide, ide suffix. So spelling becomes important. I-D-E and I-T-E have different meanings. Oh, let me shut this door until this person walks by. That's so much better. Yeah, I don't know if it's Halo because they're in the air. I don't know the answer. I, I'd have to look it up. I'm sure, if you, I'm sure you can find it if you look it up. Um, anyway, so, and typically we don't use mono for the first, if it's on the first element, but we do on the second. So the, the names are really simple. Uh, and then the prefixes, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, just to, to complete, if we go one through 10, they're the same thing they use for polygons. All right, it's mono, di, tri, Tetra, I put this one down here, Penta, like a Pentagon, Hexa, Hepta, Octa, you're familiar with Octagon, right? Octa, Nona, Deca. That's enough. Typically, we're probably only going to go up to five, but all right. So literally this is, now if you wrote mono for the first, I wouldn't take a point off, but people would laugh at you, right? They go, oh my God, he wrote mono for God. Is monosodium glutamate then a misnomer? No, because glutamate is, a, uh, is an ion. Monosodium glutamate, yeah, because it, that's an ionic compound and we don't use those prefixes uh, for ionic compounds. You're right, it's kind of, it's kind of, so, Here's what happens is chemists use IUPAC. Older chemists, and when I say older, I mean the generation prior to me. So as I would, when I was in college, the old system was going away and the IUPAC system was kind of coming in, but my, my professors still use the old system. So older chemists will still use some of it. Biologists are gonna tend to use a little bit more you know, common names. Bio biochemistry is notorious for not for kind of doing its own rules. And monosodium glutamate, glutamate is a kind of a biomolecule. It's derived from an amino acid. So literally the name is carbon two oxygens, right? Carbon dioxide. Remember the prefix goes with whatever immediately precedes it. So see, let's, let's give yourselves a minute. See if you can come up with those.
You two done barking? I feel so safe. All right, it's hard. I can't see all of you, so I'm going to go with it. So let's see what we can do. So again, you just use the suffix. So this is one carbon, one oxygen. We typically don't say mono for the first. So that would be carbon. Well, let's just go to the next slide, right? So carbon monoxide, right? This is one phosphorus and three chlorines. So remember, we, we end the second one with IDE. So phosphorus and three chlorines, phosphorus trichloride. And then nitrogen dioxide. And just for fun, let's do one more just to see this one with a, a different prefix. What if we did this one? P2O5. That's a five right there. So this is two is di. P is phosphorus. And then five is pent oxide. Um, when you burn a match, matches have phosphorus on, on the head of a match. The smoke contains some of this. This just gee whiz. So you just, how many and what's the element? How many, what's the element, okay? And then the second one ends in I. So if you wrote diphosphorus pent oxygen, that would be incorrect. So the spelling is important, the I-D-E. You know, if you misspelled phosphorus, you know, what I typically do on stuff, like if you spell something a little weird, uh, but I can still figure out what it is, typically I'll correct it and not take a point off. But if you misspell it, to the point that you've spelled something else, th then it's wrong, okay? So do your best. All right. And then let's go the other way. All right. So let's try going the other way. Give you a couple minutes. All right, so I'm going to, so let me go ahead. So if you just look at the name, this is sulfur and two oxygens. So it's going to be SO2, right? Dinitrogen means two nitrogens, monoxide, one oxygen. We don't write a one. This one has a common name you may have heard of. It says laughing gas or nitrous oxide. That's a common name, though. Uh, carbon, C. Tetra means four. Carbon tetrafluoride, CF4. That would be a what's called a CFC. You may have heard of CFCs. Chlorofluorocarbon is a chlorofluorocarbon. And the reason we're talking about these is when we do some uh, climate chemistry, sulfur dioxide is a big deal, a uh, pollutant. Uh, so is the, all three of these, carbon tetrafluoride is not, but sulfur, sulfur dioxide, dinitrogen monoxide, uh, very common common pollutants. Right. Uh, now, uh, let's see. So then this part, so when elements form compounds, we talked about chemical changes before. And so remember in a chemical change, you're forming new substances. And that's when chemical bonds are broken and formed. All right, and I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna to go to the slideshow because we'll watch this, this little short video. Videos don't work unless you're in slideshow mode. Uh, professor, can I ask one question? Um, you can ask, yes, by all means. Gas is usually called nitrous oxide. N2O, 
Yeah, that's a common name though. Oh, okay. So, yeah. but the nitrous should be dinitrous. No, oh. dinitrogen monoxide. Oh, okay. It's just called, I don't, it, you know, it's a long time ago they called it nitrous oxide. I don't really know why. Let's go from the current slide. All right. So we talked about this before, signs of chemical changes. So, you know, observable evidence, heat, some, you know, heat, heat can be misleading, but, you know, in general, heat, light, a new color, solid when there wasn't one, a new, yeah, a new odor. Um, let's see how this, this should work. So from this, let's let the video come up. Not a long video. There you go. You guys will do this in the lab, I think. Yeah. There you go. So a lot of light. And then if you look at it, it's hard to see. See, there's the magnesium metal, right? This makes it easier to see it. And it looks like a piece of metal. And then when it's done, it's a white powder. And so it obviously looks like a very different substance as well. So there's a very big change in physical. Yeah, you can kind of see the powder just kind of stuck to it. All right. Whoops. Oh, oh no, that's okay. All right. So sign of a chemical change was the light, right? We can tell there's a new substance because it, it just looks really different. And let's see, do we do that? Are you guys going to do that one? Well, you're going to do some stuff like that. I don't know if we're, I don't remember if that's an experiment two. I, in the experiment three has got some cool stuff though. You guys are going to do experiment three in the lab. So, all right. So um, just some other things about chemical changes and some other terms. If you react something with oxygen, it's called combustion or burning, right? Or even oxidation. So adding oxygen is oxidation. Oxidation actually has another meaning, but adding oxygen is oxidation. Burning, so if I say something burns, burn means combines with oxygen or combustion, same, they're all synonyms. So you asked earlier, is oxygen flammable? Um, yeah, I don't know if oxygen itself burns, but if you combine it with other things, they burn. If you've ever taken a course, you know, using fire extinguishers, the fire triangle, the three things you need for a fire are fuel, oxygen, and heat. Right. And so if you remove any one of those three, the fire will go out. And so if you get rid of the oxygen, the wood can't burn without oxygen. Uh, some other terms. So and again, this is if you just think in terms of. Um, uh, uh, prefixes exo like exit. Right. So therm like heat exothermic is a reaction that gives off heat. Endothermic is a reaction that absorbs heat. So if you were holding a, react, a, a reaction in a container and it was exothermic, the container would get warm. If you're holding a reaction, you're holding a container where a reaction is going on and it's endothermic, it'll get cold because it will be sucking the heat out. And of course, we represent them with chemical equations. All right. So these are just examples, more, more pretty pictures of evidence of a chemical reaction. We'll do it on time. I got 20 minutes, good. All right, so color change like the first one, giving off light. Um, again, you have to be a little bit careful about even giving off light. If you, you know, if you heat up some things, they just glow red, right? But, or, or they'll glow, but in general, giving off light. Um, forming a solid when it wasn't there. For uh, formation of a gas, so if you mix, um, baking soda and vinegar, right? If you take baking soda and vinegar and all those bubbles that come up, you're, you're forming a gas there. Bubble, you know, the best evidence of gas uh, is you'll see bubbles if it's in a liquid or, you know, not always an odor because some gases don't have an odor, right? Does and clouded heat, mean there's something else in it with it? Say that again? It says, uh, 
if it was it says previously clear does that mean there's something in it that made it cloudy yeah so if i take two clear colorless liquids and i mix them together and i form a solid there's obviously a reaction there that's what that means so the formation of a solid in a previously clear solution so if you look at this picture where's my mouse my mouse has decided it doesn't want to show up anymore it's probably because i'm in this mode here oh there we go uh okay if you look at this this here you can see this is clear and that a solid's forming that's what that means and it's a little hard to see on the slides all right so a chemical equation is we're going to we can represent chemical reactions with what are called chemical equations. They have both qualitative and quantitative information. So qualitative is what happened, quantitative is the how much part. We're not going to do a lot of quantitative chemistry in this class. We're not going to do a lot of the math, um, but we are going to do a lot of the qual. But we'll do a little bit, and then we often will specify the state of each reactant or product in parentheses next to the formula, so like solid, liquid, gas. Uh, on the left side of the equation, they're called reactants, and the right side are called products. And we use an arrow, it's not an equal sign, because reactants and products are different things. So you see on the bottom, reactants, that's an arrow, it's just, it doesn't, it, uh, I didn't have the, the thing. So reactants form products, or you say products are formed from reactants. Uh, these two things react to form, right? So uh, this is just kind of a, a visualization. So if you burn methane, methane is uh, natural gas. So if you have a gas heater, okay, natural gas is methane. Uh, and methane is CH4. Uh, we'll get, do a little bit of that nomenclature as well. Um, I know it's, I think it's in these slides. Methane is CH4, and you see the G in parentheses, that means it's a gas. And then I'm gonna combine it with oxygen gas. And so you can see uh, the picture here. Here's the methane, CH4. These are structural, we're, we're gonna do structure eventually too. And then uh, this is oxygen molecule, two oxygen atoms. And then we're gonna form carbon dioxide, CO2, and water. Now, what's interesting, uh, remember the law of conservation of matter? It says that matter can't be created or destroyed. If you look here, see how I have one, two, three oxygen atoms, and over here I only have two. Also here I have one carbon, which I have one carbon here, but here I have only two hydrogens, and here I have four hydrogens. See that? You can even count them this way. So that means that this equation is not, the conservation, matter is not conserved in this equation. All right, and we're going to deal with that uh, coming up. The, and so this equation is what we say is not balanced, and we have to account for that. But before I do that, I just want you to get a, just the qualitatively, you can see again, breaking and forming chemical bonds. The hydrogens were attached to the carbon, and the oxygens were attached to each other. We broke those apart, we broke those apart, and then we put them back together, but we rearranged them. Another way of thinking of a chemical equation, it's a rearrangement of the atoms. So now the oxygens are attached to the carbon, and then another oxygen is attached, the hydrogens are attached to another oxygen. So interestingly too, when you talk about energy, we don't, we're not really talking about that right now. Breaking and forming chemical bonds involves energy changes. You can think of breaking a chemical bond kind of like breaking a rubber band. And if you break a rubber band, right, it releases energy. It makes a noise, you can hear the snap. Um, you can feel it when it snaps into your hand. So that's a release of energy. Forming chemical bonds usually absorbs energy. And so if there's energy release in a reaction, that means that the energy from breaking the bonds was maybe more than the energy to form them. And so some of the energy just comes out as heat or going the other way. Some reactions only happen if you give them energy, right? So cooking, you can't cook bread or you can't cook an egg unless you heat it. So that means you got to put energy in to break those chemical bonds. So some reactions require heat, some reactions give off energy. Okay. Now, does that mean that chemical cooking always involves heat, like ceviche? Uh, if you're cooking food, 
It involves heat. Yeah. Well, I mean, like sometimes you can you can do it with so it will form a heat. Like I'm I'm thinking of like a citrus or something like that can cook like a shellfish. Like you know how sometimes you put like like a marinade, but it'll actually yeah. Cook. There's some there. I believe I thought there was a way to chemically cook things, but I assume it involves involve heat as well. Well, you do you do use lemon like the acid from lemons to cook fish. That uh, yeah. But, but the lemon doesn't really cook the fish, right? What the lemon does is, you know, the, the fishy taste is, is, uh, is from the oil and that oil uh, reacts with the lemon juice and that gets rid of a lot of that fishy taste. And it's actually, it's, it's a kind of a biochemical reaction. The oils, uh, fish oils are what are called amines. They're structurally similar to ammonia, but they're amines with a lot of carbons. And, but amines are, Again, we're kind of getting a little off topic, but since you brought it up, um, that's a little acid base chemistry. So an amine is what's called alkaline or basic. The words alkaline and basic are synonyms and uh, uh, lemons are, are acidic. And so if you take uh, an acid and you react it with the base, it'll neutralize it. And it's a chemical reaction. And so that flavor, that odor goes away a little bit. Also, it'll make it more water soluble, so it'll tend to wash it off. It'll tend to wash off more; won't be quite as sticking to the fish. I don't know. You know, I'd have to think. I, you know, I'm sure there's some way uh, you could just mix the right chemicals, and it would give off enough heat. But even cooking things in a microwave, you know, it's not the same kind of cooking. But what a microwave does is it makes water molecules spin around. And if you take your hands and you rub them together, right, it gets really warm. Well, imagine that having you know, water molecules spinning around inside of food that heat from them spinning around can cook food as well. But bottom line is you're still using, you have to use energy of some type to break and form the chemical bonds in cooking. You know, I would imagine there may be some magical chemical way to do it. I don't know the answer to that question for sure. Off the top of my head, I don't know one. All right, what are we doing on time? I don't want to do a lot with balancing equations today, but let's kind of introduce it. Let me see what we are slide wise. This goes up to, where are we? We're on, it goes up to 34 and we are on 14. So there's still 20, so I'll do a few more. All right, so um, what we can do to balance the equation, right? Is we have to, uh, you see how, like we said that there's not enough hydrogen on the right-hand side and there's an extra oxygen on the right-hand side. So what we do is we have to do what's called balancing the equation. To balance the equation, we use coefficients and let's see if I did my thing. All right, so what balancing means that the law of conservation of matter is obeyed. That means there have to be the same number of each atom on both sides of the equation. So if you look at this, this is a, a way that ammonia is formed. You take nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and you mix them under high pressure and you can form ammonia. Now, but if you count, you see how on the left-hand side, Remember that the subscript goes with whatever immediately precedes it. So there's two nitrogens and there's two hydrogens. But in ammonia, there's only one nitrogen and three hydrogens. So it looks like if you're just glancing, you say, oh, we converted a nitrogen into a hydrogen, but you can't do that. So there's one fewer nitrogen on the right and one more hydrogen. I'm oh, sorry, one, yeah, right? So the way we fix this is we use coefficients, right? So if we go back to the combustion of methane, so if we took two oxygen molecules, then we can do this. We're still forming the same things, right? We're taking this and this, making this and this, but to get everything balanced, you need a, a little bit more oxygen. And, also, and that, takes, that gives you a place for the other hydrogen to go. And so what this is, is a methane plus two oxygen molecules will form a carbon dioxide and two waters. So what happens is the, set, the, the, the coefficient, the two goes with whatever follows it. So it's like saying, um, I don't know, it, it's two of the oxygens. So it's two times two is four oxygen atoms. Just like two, hydro, two waters, that means there's four hydrogens and two oxygens total. So there's the same number of each type, we just have, have to throw in a little bit more. And this is also how it reacts. So if you don't have enough, if you're trying to burn methane and you don't have enough oxygen, you're not necessarily gonna do the reaction the same way, it'll go differently. 
That's when you get incomplete combustion. That's when you get carbon monoxide. So you know, methane is very, very common. If you have, if you're heating your home with gas, uh, you know, people, you have to have nowadays. You have to have a carbon. You're supposed to have a carbon monoxide detector because if your furnace isn't adjusted correctly, you don't have enough oxygen, and you'll form carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. And carbon monoxide is extremely toxic. So these are my rules for balance, Rob's rules, meaning I kind of made them up. So rule zero, I call it rule zero because it is so important. This is where you would say, how important is it? My little ode to Johnny Carson. Uh, it's so important that you have to do that before you start. So if your formulas are wrong, you're balancing, at the very least, you're balancing the wrong equation, all right? Once your formulas are right, you never ever change a subscript. Once the formulas are right, you may have to play with subscripts to get the formulas right. But once, once you've written the formulas correctly, you don't change a subscript. If you change a subscript, the gods of chemistry will become angry, the skies will darken, and a bolt of lightning will hit you, all right? So we do uh, use coefficients to balance. Uh, if an element's by itself, just make your life easy, save it for last. Typically we balance oxygen towards the end and hydrogen next to last. And that's because oxygen is typically found in a lot of compounds. And I think what we'll do, uh, we'll do maybe one or two. Oops. All right, so if we, let's, well, we'll do this, this, this example. So here's my unbalanced equation. The formulas are correct. But what I mean by don't change a subscript, you can't go, oh, I know, I'll just make it N2H2. Changing the subscripts, I don't want to get hit by lightning, but not only that, N2H2 doesn't exist. But if it did, it still wouldn't be an H3. It's not ammonia, all right? So first what we do is we do some bookkeeping. We just make a list of the elements and count them. So I have nitrogen and I, on each side, hydrogen on each side. And it's a good idea to go in the same order on both sides just to make your life easier. Anytime you're doing any type of problem solving, whether it's math or chemistry, it's really good to be organized in your problem solving because problem solving is difficult enough. If you're disorganized, you can't even keep track of what you're doing. So, you know, what, you can use my organizational scheme or you can use someone else's, but, you know, have an organizational scheme. And then we're going to count them. So there's two nitrogens, there's two hydrogens, there's one nitrogen, and there's three hydrogens. So now what we're going to do, let's fix the nitrogen. Okay, so we go here. So let's fix, this is, this is where I left off. We're gonna fix the nitrogen first because it's unbalanced. There's two here and one here. So how do we fix it? We're gonna put a two in front of the ammonia. That'll give us two nitrogens. Once you change a uh, coefficient, you have to count again. So we're gonna fix the nitrogen. So I put a two here. Now we're gonna recount. So I left the old numbers there and crossed them out. So I still have two and two on the left. But now I have two nitrogens, but I have six hydrogens. See that? Two times three. So what I've done is I fixed the nitrogen problem, and now I have to, now the hydrogen's messed up. So now, there we go. So now we have to fix the hydrogen. We'll go to the next slide. Theoretically. There we go. So this is where we left off. So to fix the hydrogen, I have to get, I have to get to six. I can't go down, I can only go up. So what number times two equals six, right? Two, what times two equals six? Oh yeah, three. So we put a three here. And now once you change a coefficient, we count everything. So I have two nitrogens, two nitrogens, that's good. I now have six hydrogens, six hydrogens. That's the balanced equation. And when this reaction takes place, two nitrogens react with three hydrogens and you get two ammonia. All right, I think. Professor, I had a question right. real quick. Um, so for the initial equation that you had, so N2 plus H2, you can't, you can't do that without balancing, right? You can't continue with anything unless you balance it, correct? You mean starting here? Yeah, so like it, it doesn't mean anything unless you have a balanced well, equation. Well, it, it's not, it's telling you what happened, but it's not, even, it's, 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 it's not correct because you don't have, matter's not conserved, right? You can't really yeah. do with it from there. In fact, and you know, me personally, it hurts my eyes. 
<laughs> Definitely. Okay, so like, so would you see that in like later on in the future that equation, or would you see it balanced out more frequently? You're always gonna see it when, when it's all done. They're always gonna be balanced. Okay. Okay. Thank organic, you. Organic chemistry uh, gets a little tricky because organic chemistry we don't always know what all the products are. But yeah, you have to start. You know, when you see an equation, you need all equations for the rest of your life need to be balanced. Absolutely. Okay. Thank and that, you. And it's not. It's t it's not. There are some that are a little bit more complicated, but it's not terribly complicated to balance them. It's usually about as, as difficult as I just did. All right. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. So to summarize, balancing first, we get the formulas right. Do some bookkeeping. Count the elements on how many of each element on each side. Change the coefficients one at a time. After every coefficient change, you recount them. If you keep going around in a circle, meaning you, you keep doing it and you can't get it to balance, you can't get it to balance, you probably have a formula wrong. Right? That's usually, uh, you know, I've been teaching chemistry for a long time. And when I get a student says, I can't get this to balance, and they come to my office, I go, You got a formula wrong. Almost always. All right. Okay. I think this is a good. Good stopping point. So uh, we'll stop here. I'll pick up on this slide next time. So on Monday, we're going to finish these slides. All right. And then we, uh, we may or may not, we might start the next set just, you know, in the interest of time. And then on Wednesday of next week, we're going to do an exam review. That's all we will do. And then, of course, the following week, we'll be back in the classroom. And I'll remind you of all that. All right, so I am done. Let me turn off the screen share, turn off the recording.